Hitler, it all came down to the B-2. The world's first liquid-fueled ballistic missile and Germany's last great hope of winning the war. In September 1944, Germany fired the first V-2s against London, terrorizing a war-weary city. But Hitler had thousands more in production. The largest number of rockets came from the mysterious Nordhausen V-2 rocket plant. In a secret location near the heart of Germany, the V-2 rocket factory located near the town of Nordhausen churned out 6,000 missiles in the last 15 months of the war. Slave laborers worked day and night, forced to try and meet Hitler's production goals in the one million square foot factory, which was as brutal as it was big. We had no, uh, no real food, no drink, no water, no water. No, we couldn't wash ourselves, there was nothing. V2 assembly took place in the Mittelwerk, or Central Works. But other areas of the Nordhausen facility produced V1 buzz bombs and jet engines. The cavernous complex primarily consisted of two parallel tunnels, 35 feet wide and 25 feet tall, and one mile in length. 46 cross tunnels joined the two main tunnels, like the rungs on a ladder providing over one million square feet of floor space. The mountain itself into which the factory, the Middlework factory was built, is uh, anhydrite gypsum and therefore fairly easily dug. Today the factory is buried under tons of rock, partially destroyed after the war. But a small portion of the once extensive complex is open to the public. After almost 60 years, the dimly lit tunnels hide many secrets. Weapon parts still litter the floor. A few chambers are flooded, drowning an infamous past. The history of the factory is inseparably linked to the history of its product, the V-2 rocket. That story begins in the late 1920s with two very different factions. A German army eager to regain its former power after the loss of World War I. And a group of amateur rocketeers who dreamed of space flight. Even before the rise of Hitler, Germany wished to rearm. The Versailles Treaty signed at the end of World War I left Germany weak by restricting the size of the country's military and forbidding the manufacture of long-range guns. However, it said nothing about rockets. In an effort to make the German army stronger, Karl Becker, chief of the ballistics and munitions section, launched a rocket program in 1929. General Becker was very interested in the idea of a ballistic missile, that is, of a large, probably liquid-fueled missile that would be able to bombard enemy cities and carry out a surprise attack that might demoralize the enemy, resulting in a, a sudden victory. But the solid-fuel rockets of the day were little more than giant toys, far less accurate than artillery. To transform the rocket from toy to terror, the Army needed help. In the early 1930s, the Army started recruiting rocket enthusiasts from several amateur rocketry clubs. One enthusiast, Werner von Braun, a brilliant young engineering student and German aristocrat, captured their attention. Von Braun was interested in flying into space. He was interested in the peaceful uses of space. He was interested in going to the moon and going to Mars. That's really his passion. Yet even at the age of 20, he realized getting to the moon would take considerable resources. He saw the Army as an opportunity to break out of the limits of this small-scale amateur rocketry. And there was no other uh, organization around that was likely to finance rocketry on a major scale. In 
December 1932, two months before Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor. Von Braun started working on rocket weaponry for Army Ordnance at the Kummersdorf Weapon Range, 25 miles southwest of Berlin. It was a black program. It was really a super, super secret program, and nobody was supposed to know about it. Army Ordnance hoped one day rockets would serve as long-range artillery. The goal was to build a series of rockets, each generation larger and more capable than the last. In 1932, von Braun started working on the rocket designated the A-1, soon followed by the A-2 and the A-3. But these were merely intended as stepping stones for a real rocket weapon that was on the horizon, the A-4. Von Braun excelled at Kummersdorf, quickly proving himself an astute engineer and born leader. But by 1936, the rocket program had outgrown its facilities at Kummersdorf prompting the construction of the Pinamundo Rocket Development Facility on the Baltic coast. A joint army and air force endeavor. Since both the army and the air force were trying to develop weapons that uh, were beyond the ordinary, uh, they looked for a place where they had the room to develop, which Pinamunda did, and also being close to water, they could fire their rockets without concern about where they were coming down. Pinamundo was a monumental engineering challenge. Engineers had to build hangars, sketching rooms, workshops, machine rooms, living quarters, and a new harbor, all in a very remote location. Eventually, the factory added test stands and the most sophisticated wind tunnel of its time. Hitler was pushing to prepare the country for war, which provided funding for the rocket program. In return, the facility was expected to produce a workable weapon within a few years. In 1937, 25-year-old Werner von Braun was appointed technical director of the army side. While Walter Dornberger, an artillery officer and engineer, became chief of army rocket development. Dornberger was the liaison between the technical group under von Braun and army ordnance leadership. He protected the program, he administered the program from Berlin, and he ensured that it continued to progress and continue to grow. In less than five years, the rocket division expanded from a handful of engineers to thousands of designers, machinists, and technicians. Carl Becker made his objectives clear. Secretly build a rocket weapon to surprise and defeat an unsuspecting enemy. But the young rocket program would face unprecedented technical challenges to make science fiction fact. In 1936, Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger, working for the German army, drew up specifications for the fourth generation rocket, the A-4. It would be Josef Goebbels who later renamed the A-4 the V-2 for Vergeltungswaffe 2, or Vengeance Weapon 2. By that time, the V-1 designation had already been claimed by the Luftwaffe's flying bomb. The Army's V-2 would be a monster, 46 feet tall, capable of generating 55,000 pounds of thrust, 17 times more powerful than the A-3. It would carry a one-ton explosive warhead, enough to flatten a city block. And it would travel nearly five times the speed of sound, many times faster than any machine ever built. The missile would burn for about one minute after liftoff, steered by a gyroscopic guidance system. The rocket would rise to an altitude of 50 miles on a ballistic trajectory before the engine would automatically shut off. 
and send the missile falling back to its target. As the engineers at Pinamunda struggled with the technical challenges of producing such an advanced weapon, Hitler ordered the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. Without warning, ordnance pushed the V-2 production date up from 1943 to 1941. But at the time, the first V-2 hadn't left the ground. With a new sense of urgency, Pinamunda engineers managed by von Braun tackled guidance, aerodynamics, and booster design. The V-2 was a liquid propellant missile. It used liquid oxygen and alcohol as the two propellants. The body of the V-2 was uh, dominated by two large tanks for those two propellants. And there were a lot of difficulties finding a way to inject the propellants and mix them and burn them properly and not create fires or burn throughs. In order to move those propellants to the engine, you needed turbo pumps. 12 tons of propellants had to be moved to the engine in one minute and inject them into the combustion chamber. Above the tanks, you needed a control section, and that's where the, the guidance and control and radio equipment would be located at the tip of the missile, then the warhead. Von Braun's team built a prototype in just three years, but at an enormous expense. Initial tests were also discouraging. If the engineers couldn't produce a reliable weapon soon, Hitler would surely halt rocket development. After two failed launch attempts, the future of the program was at stake. Von Braun and Dornberger prepared a V-2 for launch on October 3, 1942. Shortly before 4 p.m., the rocket lifted off. It worked, reaching an altitude of 50 miles and crashing into the sea 120 miles away. But duplicating its success proved difficult in the beginning. Adding more pressure on the V-2 program, the Luftwaffe had introduced a competing missile project in the spring of 1942. The FI-103, soon to be known as the V-1 Flying Bomb, the world's first operational cruise missile. The V-1 would be powered by a pulse jet engine, not a rocket. It would fly only 400 miles per hour staying low to the ground at an altitude of a few thousand feet. It lacked the V-2's element of surprise because of its loud engine, but it would be cheaper, faster, and easier to produce. There was a lot of competition because one, the V-1 was Air Force, the V-2 was basically artillery, ordnance, and uh, both programs were trying to get funds for something that had never previously been developed. Each weapon had advantages over the other, and Hitler decided to support both. Von Braun knew that going into full-scale production on the V-2 was premature, but he didn't have a choice. Hitler and the army demanded weapons. Army ordnance ordered Von Braun and the development engineers to turn manufacturing over to those in charge of production. Arthur Rudolph became the, essentially the manufacturing and production end of the program. He was the expert on building the rockets on the shops that constructed them. Rudolph, who had been with the program for 10 years, was confronted by a daunting challenge. Get a quasi-operational rocket ready for mass production with diminishing resources and a crippling lack of skilled German laborers. The war pulled men from the factories to the front, and Rudolf couldn't find enough trained German personnel to assemble V2s. But there was a large supply of unexploited workers at Rudolf's disposal. Forced labor from SS concentration camps. The decision Rudolf was about to make marred the integrity of the rocket program and forever haunted the individuals involved, including Walter Dornberger and Werner von Braun. 
Rudolph writes a memorandum that says, this is a good idea, we can use concentration camp prisoners and their secrecy will be completely protected and the SS will take all the responsibility for feeding and housing them. On June 17, 1943, the first of more than 1,200 detainees arrived at Pinamunda from Buchenwald concentration camp. A few were trained machinists. Most, however, knew nothing about manufacturing. The first thing we saw when we arrived in Pinamunda was the V-2 rocket. That was a shock to all of us. Suddenly, are in front of things we never even dreamed existed. By the summer of 1943, the top secret project was no longer secret. Reports of mystery weapons had leaked to the Allies. On August 18, 1943, a British Royal Air Force bombing raid would force V-2 production underground to a labyrinth of tunnels outside of the town of Nordhausen, Germany. In the summer of 1943, engineers... But shortly after 1 a.m. on August 18, 1943, mighty concussions rocked Pinamunda as the British Royal Air Force bombed the factory. The bombardment is very noisy. When you see things flying around you, you know, when you never know if it's going to hit. But to us, it was not scared. It was a joy, because we saw for the first time that the Allies knew that we were existing. The raid heavily damaged the factory and sent managers into a panic. In the days after the attack, armaments minister Albert Speer and Reich leader of the SS Heinrich Himmler joined Hitler in emergency meetings. Himmler suggested moving V2 production underground. A location was chosen a petroleum storage facility 220 miles southwest of Pinamunda, near the center of the country. The future of the German rocket program, and perhaps of Germany itself, would reside in the tunnel complex near the town of Nordhausen. The Nazis became interested in the Nordhausen area seven years earlier, in 1936 when a government agency decided to build a large underground storage facility for oil and strategic materials in preparation for war. A site was chosen near Nordhausen at Kohnstein Mountain. Anhydrite used for making fertilizer and explosives was already being mined there. The soft rock was good for tunneling, yet required minimal supports. In June of 1936, 400 miners went to work on the first stage of the project. The final plans called for two parallel main tunnels that would stretch over a mile through the mountain. Barrels of petroleum would be stored in cross tunnels or galleries, connecting the two main tunnels like the rungs of a ladder. Over the next seven years, Miners excavated millions of tons of rock. By 1943, most of the tunnels were complete and held four million gallons of oil, the largest cache in the country. But after the bombing at Pinamunda, Hitler allowed the transformation of the nearly completed oil depot into a rocket factory. Mass assembly would ship from Pinamunda to Nordhausen. But von Braun, the technical director of rocket development, would stay at Pinamunda, working on other missile projects and improving the V-2. Himmler, eager to become a bigger player in the rocket division, offered more concentration camp labor to build the factory and later assemble rockets. Himmler names Hans Kammler as his chief for this V-2 production. Hans Kammler was the chief of SS construction and as such had been involved in uh, building the Auschwitz gas chamber crematoria complex and he was known as a real striver, as an incredibly ambitious, forceful individual. 
Kamler's challenge was to turn a series of damp and dirty tunnels into a factory. His first task was to finish tunneling. On August 28, 1943, the first 107 concentration camp prisoners arrived at Nordhausen, soon joined by thousands more. But there weren't even barracks for the mostly Russian, Polish, and French prisoners and captured resistance fighters. For six months, we lived in this tunnel with the same clothes, pair of pants, a shirt, and a jacket without a shower. We couldn't even drink when we were caught drinking, except one cup of water a day. We used to be beaten. For six months, we never saw daylight. There was not even bunks where we could sleep, so we had to sleep on the floor wherever we could. Conditions were brutal. Blasting went on 24 hours a day. Thick dust filled the air. Prisoners worked in 12-hour shifts. But the blasting deprived them of sleep even when they weren't working. There were no toilets, no showers. Tuberculosis, pneumonia, and dysentery were rampant. By Christmas 1943, over 10,000 men were working in the tunnels digging and loading rocks into rail carts by hand, drilling ventilation shafts, installing lighting, removing oil barrels, laying train track and installing machinery. After seven months, slave laborers finished digging the tunnels and enlarging several galleries, adding more than 135,000 square feet to the size of the factory. Of the thousands of workers who went into the tunnels, 3,000 died during the expansion, victims of overwork, malnutrition, and disease. The Nazi leadership had convinced themselves that this was a secret weapon which could change the course of the war. The lives of the prisoners meant nothing. After tunneling, prisoners poured concrete for a level foundation. Sometimes it, it happened that um, some prisoners which were unfit to work further on, they fell down and they were filled with, with concrete. So the tunnel system is not only a memorial, it is a cemetery. While many prisoners expanded the tunnel complex, others constructed concentration camp Dora. Although the prisoners living in the tunnels eventually would have barracks to sleep in, this was little consolation for the thousands living on the brink of death. To rid the camp of dead bodies, sacrificed to build Hitler's rocket, the SS installed a crematorium at Dora. But before the crematorium was operational, thousands of bodies were shipped to Camp Buchenwald. Seeing the arriving cargo, Buchenwald prisoners surmised the only thing Dora produced was corpses. As bodies left Dora, trainloads of equipment from Pinamunda and other factories started arriving. By late 1943, Germany was desperate. Hitler clung to the hope that the tunnels near Nordhausen would produce a miracle. With the threat of an Allied invasion looming, it became all important to get the Nordhausen V2 factory operational. Slave laborers were forced to ready the Nordhausen factory for mass production, installing presses, welders, drills, lathes, and other manufacturing tools. V2 assembly would take place in the Mittelwerk, or Central Works. By January 1944, in less than four months, the factory produced its first 50 V2s. But 50 rockets wouldn't win the war. Hitler wanted thousands of V2s. The factory was expected to manufacture 900 a month. 
To try and meet this unrealistic goal, Arthur Rudolph, the former assembly manager at Pinamunda, was put in charge of the Middleburg production at Nordhausen. He was responsible for ensuring that the V2s were produced, ensuring that the components uh, came that, that were of adequate quality and that the assembly process ran on time. While Rudolf set up the assembly factory at Nordhausen, Werner von Braun remained at Pinamunda, refining the V2. However, he made several trips to see the factory's progress. Once established, Rudolf's assembly line used 5,000 forced laborers and 3,000 German civilians who were not supposed to consort with the prisoners. These propaganda photos taken to illustrate the efficiency of forced labor are the only known existing images taken during manufacturing. I think that they don't show the reality. They show a, a clean factory and in, in, in reality the prisoners had uh, nearly nothing. They had no shoes. The clothing was very bad. But on the photos you can see very fit prisoners which obviously had enough to eat. And you can see clean production lines and it's not the reality of Middleberg. 17,000 different parts went into each V2 rocket. Most components, such as the propulsion unit and guidance system, came from other factories as sub-assemblies. Parts came in via rail line or on the backs of prisoners through Tunnel A, then were stored in the cross galleries. Rocket assembly took place in main tunnel B, beginning around Hall 21 with the two large liquid oxygen and alcohol fuel tanks covered by a sheet metal skin. Next came the propulsion sub-assembly with combustion chamber and turbo pumps. Workers then attached the big tail section with fins and jet vanes. Lastly, the guidance section was fitted to the front. In Hall 39, the rocket was galvanized and painted in camouflage colors to avoid being spotted from the air during transport. At the very end of assembly, the rockets reached Hall 41, where an overhead crane lifted them upright for gyroscopic testing and other analysis. Scaffolding in this, the tallest gallery, also allowed engineers to inspect each rocket. SS and Army guards used brutal tactics to keep order, but they had help. Directly supervising the laborers were capos. Capos weren't political prisoners, but often German convicts who received special treatment for managing the line. The punishment often is hanging or beating. Beating was constantly. Capo were always beating us. Capo were always behind us. They wanted to impress the SS, so they were beating us constantly. Production gradually increased from 50 V2s in January 1944 to 437 per month by May. But the rocket rushed into production, had many problems at the launch pad. Most failed V2s that came out of this plant were mostly because it was such a complicated weapon. There were many things that could go wrong, many ways for it to fail. But there was prisoner sabotage. I was French. Some other were Russians, some other were Poles. And nobody wanted Germany to win the war. So we tried sabotage. Yves Bayon, a welder on the assembly line, risked his life by making shoddy welds on internal sections. The Russians. <laughs> they are completely mad. Completely mad. They, they pissed on machines, for instance. So, uh, when they were caught like that, they were hanged. The following Sunday, on the Olko Square, we didn't have any um, football place, so instead of football, we had the hanging. 
By the spring of 1944, the Middlewerk was producing around 400 rockets a month, 13 per day. Within months, Allied bombing raids on key industrial plants also forced B-1 and jet engine production into the Nordhausen complex. By September 8, 1944, Germany finally had enough V-2 rockets to launch the first wave against London and recently liberated Paris. It seemed like Hitler's last hope. The weapon terrorized war-weary London. Unlike the V-1, which made plenty of noise, the V-2 gave no advanced warning when it fell out of the sky. Over the next eight months, Germany launched 4,300 V-2s on Allied targets. Hitler dreamed it would win the war, but expectation far exceeded performance. The V-2 was never as accurate as the army wished. While V-2s did kill 5,000 people, they never posed enough of a threat to turn the tide of the war. The V-2 could only carry a one-ton warfare head, and therefore its effectiveness as a weapon was limited. But as a technological breakthrough, it was an astounding uh, transformation. Although Germany produced nearly 6,000 V-2s, the numbers are misleading. The Mittelwerk factory near Nordhausen never in fact met production quotas. And a high percentage of those built were flawed. I think that the efficiency of the Mittelwerk was a part of the illusion of the rocket engineers who thought that it was possible to construct a rocket weapon for the so-called Antsieg, the final victory. The Mittelwerk continued assembling V2s even as the Allies advanced to within miles of the plant. Finally, around April 5th, managers abandoned the factory and evacuated the healthy prisoners from Camp Dora. When the U.S. 3rd Armored Division entered Dora and a subcamp in Nordhausen on April 11th, they made a gruesome discovery. Thousands of corpses, victims of disease and malnutrition. Some had been machine gunned by the SS, but many were the victims of an RAF bombing raid on Nordhausen. About 600 prisoners, too sick to move, were left behind when the plant managers fled. When the Allies arrived, the war was finally over for prisoners who remained at Dora. There's no feeling. I laid on the floor. And kissed the ground. I still get emotional. We, we survived. Alex Baum was one of the lucky ones. He escaped in the chaos of evacuation. But the Dora camp system consumed the lives of 25,000 prisoners, worked to death, starved to death, executed. Although the U.S. Army controlled the Middlewerk, the role of the Nordhausen factory was far from over. The secrets kept underground would affect the entire world in the next decade and change the course of warfare altogether. On April 11, 1945, U.S. intelligence teams finally discovered the military secrets of the tunnels, weapons still on the assembly line teams were ordered to act fast. The Russians would soon take possession of the plant. Under the Yalta Agreement signed in February 1945, Nordhausen would fall in the Soviet zone of occupation. The Americans raced to ship B-2 parts, enough to assemble a hundred rockets and tons of technical documents back to the United States. From the standpoint of national defense, it just makes good sense to capture as much information as possible from this defeated enemy. If we don't do it, 
Clearly, other people will. The U.S. also sought the brains behind the technology. Understanding his value to the Americans, Von Braun, nursing a broken arm from a car accident, turned himself over to the U.S. Army on May 2nd, 1945. Werner Von Braun was uh, exceptionally excited because he viewed the Americans as the nation that had the greatest capability to further his desire to fly in space. Under Project Paperclip, Von Braun and several hundred other German specialists from all fields were brought to the U.S. Intelligence carefully screened every engineer. One thing that looked good for Werner Von Braun when he came to the U.S. was a short stint in jail he had served in 1944. The Gestapo threw Von Braun in jail for a few comments he made at a party regarding the desperate war situation and his desire to go into space. Werner Von Braun was arrested because there were some people who believed that he was not being properly oriented toward the war effort, but what he really wanted to do was fly in space. And they viewed him as uh, somehow disloyal in that context. And it took some, some friends in high places to get him released. Von Braun had joined the Nazi party in 1937. He asserted it was an official demand. Paperclip guidelines allowed engineers who were passive members of the Nazi party to enter the country, but not ardent Nazis or war criminals. Regardless, it would take an aggressive PR campaign to sell American citizens on the employment of former Nazis. There was some controversy immediately after the war in the 46-47 time frame. And there were protests from Jewish groups, from liberal groups, about the use of former Nazis in the American weapons programs. The Cold War kind of killed all the discussion about that, or, or, or really silenced it. Despite the controversy, the Army shipped Von Braun and 120 German engineers to Fort Bliss, Texas, where they would help develop the U.S. ballistic missile program. The engineers reassembled and fired V-2s at the White Sands Proving Grounds. But it was spaceflight that Von Braun dreamed about. He became a prominent spokesman for space exploration. In 1955, he also became a U.S. citizen. This is uh, one of the proudest and most significant days in my life. It's almost like getting married. In 1960, Von Braun became director of the Marshall Space Center with the challenge of designing the Saturn V moon rocket. Helping him were many of his former Pinamunda engineers, including Arthur Rudolph. But even as Von Braun worked to take America to the moon, there were those who accused him of misconduct for his association with the Middleburg. The issue still raises debate. He, of course, said he really didn't know what was taking place there. He had some vague ideas, but no first-hand knowledge. That's probably mostly true. He visited the plant on occasion. He did see some of the activities that took place there, but he certainly didn't have intimate knowledge. When Brown is not responsible for the creation of the underground plant, nor is he responsible for the decision to use slave labor at Panamunda in the spring of 43. But he is uh, a knowledgeable leader of the program. He knows what's going on, and he doesn't say anything. He doesn't even seem very disturbed by it. Von Braun's Saturn V rocket took men to the moon in 1969. Eight years later, he died of cancer. At the time of his death, most of the American public knew nothing about the Middleburg controversy and remembered Von Braun as a space visionary. History wasn't so kind to one of Von Braun's associates. In 1979, Congress created the Office of Special Investigation to find Nazi war criminals still living in the U.S. A recently published account of the Nordhausen factory implicated Arthur Rudolph, the former Saturn V project director of war crimes. After investigation, 
the OSI accused Rudolf of exploiting prisoners during the war. It was Rudolf who wrote the memo advocating the use of concentration camp labor in 1943. Instead of facing charges, Rudolf surrendered his U.S. citizenship and moved back to West Germany in 1984. After nearly 40 years in the U.S., he felt betrayed. Others felt justice had finally been served. In 1945, the U.S. handed over the underground factory to the Russians, who worked for two and a half years dismantling it. The Soviets started their own rocket program with the help of captured German engineers. In the spring of 1948, the Russians dynamited the tunnels, partially collapsing the complex. However, burying the factory proved easier than burying the truth. In 1964, the Dora concentration camp memorial was opened to commemorate those who suffered and died there. In 1995, engineers dug an access tunnel to the former factory, giving visitors a glimpse back in time. V1 and V2 parts are scattered about. Skeletons of Hitler's dream to dominate the world. They are, in a way, also symbolic of the lives lost here in the tunnels near Nordhausen. All of us who survived had a terrible feeling of guilt for years. How come me when the other one died? I think in this country we should never forget what happened in the factory, what happened in Dora. <laughs>